Julian Assange, the controversial odyssey of WikiLeaks and the fight for information transparency. Julian Paul Assange, pronounced forward slash SN forward slash Assange, originally named Hawkins, was born on 3 July 1971. He is an Australian editor, publisher, an activist who is renowned for founding WikiLeaks in 2006. Assange gained widespread international attention in 2010 when WikiLeaks released a series of classified materials provided by U.S. Army intelligence analyst Chelsea Manning. This release included footage of a U.S. airstrike in Baghdad, military logs from the Afghanistan and Iraq wars, and U.S. diplomatic cables. Assange's upbringing involved living in several towns in Australia until his family eventually settled in Melbourne during his mid-teens. He became engaged with the hacker community and faced a conviction for hacking in 1996. After establishing WikiLeaks, Assange served as its editor when it published various notable documents, such as the Bank Julius Bay documents, footage of the 2008 Tibetan unrest, and a report on political killings in Kenya in collaboration with the Sunday Times. In November 2010, Sweden issued a European arrest warrant for Assange to question him in a Swedish investigation. After losing his appeal against the warrant, he violated his bail conditions and sought refuge in the Embassy of Ecuador in London in June 2012. Ecuador granted him asylum in August 2012, citing political persecution concerns and fears of potential extradition to the United States. In 2013, Assange ran for the Australian Senate and launched the WikiLeaks party, but he did not win a seat. The Swedish investigation was dropped in 2019. On the 11th of April 2019, Assange's asylum was withdrawn amid disputes with Ecuadorian authorities, leading to his arrest. He was found guilty of breaching the Bail Act and sentenced to 50 weeks in prison. Subsequently, the U.S. government unsealed an indictment charging Assange with conspiracy to commit computer intrusion related to Manning's leaks. In May 2019 and June 2020, additional indictments were unsealed, accusing Assange of violating the Espionage Act of 1917 and conspiring with hackers. Since April 2019, Julian Assange has been detained in HM Prison Belmarsh in London while the United States government's extradition efforts are being contested in British courts. Julian Assange was born as Julian Paul Hawkins on 3 July 1971, in Tosenville, Queensland. His parents were Christine and Hawkins, a visual artist, and John Shipton, who was an anti-war activist and builder. Julian's parents separated before he was born. When he was one year old, his mother married Brett Assange, an actor with whom she ran a small theatre company. Julian later chose Assange as his surname and regards Brett as his father. However, Christine and Brett Assange divorced around 1979. Julian had a nomadic childhood, living in over 30 different Australian towns and cities. He attended various schools, including Goomenger Primary School in New South Wales from 1979 to 1983 and Tosville State High School in Queensland. He also received home schooling. In his mid-teens, he settled with his mother and half-brother in Melbourne, where he became involved in the local rave scene. He even helped set up an internet kiosk at Ollie Olson's club Night Psychic Harmony, earning him the nickname Professor. Assange pursued studies in programming, mathematics, and physics at Central Queensland University in 1994 and later at the University of Melbourne from 2003 to 2006. However, he did not complete a degree at either institution. In 1987, at the age of 16, Assange had already become a skilled hacker, going by the pseudonym Mendix, derived from Horace's Splendide Mendix in Latin, meaning nobly untruthful. During this time, the police raided his mother's home and confiscated his equipment. Assange later recalled that the raid was prompted by an individual who accused them of stealing $500,000 from Citibank. Although he wasn't charged and his equipment was returned, he decided to be more discreet in his activities. Assange adhered to a self-imposed ethical code during his hacking days. He refrained from causing damage to systems or data he accessed and believed in sharing information. 
The Sydney Morning Herald referred to him as one of Australia's most notorious hackers, and by 1991, The Guardian considered him probably Australia's most accomplished hacker. Assange's official WikiLeaks biography labelled him as Australia's most famous ethical computer hacker, and an earlier version claimed that he had hacked thousands of systems, including the Pentagon, during his youth. He, along with two others known as Trax and Prime Suspect, formed a hacking group they called the International Subversives. Assange may have been involved in the wank hack at Nasser in 1989, although this was never definitively proven. Assange referred to it as the origin of hacktivism, and the Swedish television documentary Wicker Rebels, made with his cooperation, hinted at his involvement. Around mid-1991, the three hackers began targeting Milnet, a secret data network used by the US military. Assange claimed to have discovered reports showing that the US military was hacking other parts of its own network. He found a backdoor and asserted that they had control over it for two years. Ken Day, the former head of the Australian Federal Police Computer Crime Team, noted in 2012 that there was no evidence that the international subversives had hacked Milnet. He also mentioned that Assange might still be liable to prosecution if evidence could be provided to prove his involvement. Assange developed a program called Sycophant, enabling the international subversives to carry out extensive attacks on the US military. They regularly infiltrated systems belonging to a range of key entities in the US military industrial complex and the network of the Australian National University. The Australian Federal Police, AFP, initiated an investigation called Operation Weather, focusing on the international subversives, which included Assange. In September 1991, Assange was discovered hacking into the Melbourne Master Terminal of Nortel, a Canadian multinational telecommunications corporation. Another member of the international subversives turned himself in, and the AFP subsequently tapped Assange's phone line, he was using a modem, and conducted a raid on his home at the end of October. The earliest comprehensive reports about Assange are from Australian press accounts in the 1990s and his trial. In 1994, he was charged with 31 counts related to hacking, including defrauding Telecom Australia, fraudulent use of a telecommunications network, unauthorized access to information, data erasure, and data alteration. The prosecution argued that a magazine produced by the international subversives would encourage others to engage in hacking, labeling it a hacker's manual. They alleged that Assange and the other hackers posted information online about how to hack into computers they had accessed. Assange's trial was initially set for May 1995, and his case was presented to the Supreme Court of Victoria. However, the court did not accept the case, sending it back to the county court. In December 1996, potentially facing a cumulative sentence of 290 years in prison, Assange struck a plea deal and pleaded guilty to 24 hacking charges, which included violations of the Crimes Act and fraudulent use of a telecommunications network. The judge considered the charges quite serious and initially contemplated a prison sentence. Still, ultimately, Assange was fined $2,100 and released on AA$5,000 good behavior bond due to factors such as his disrupted childhood and the absence of malicious or mercenary intent. After his sentencing, Assange expressed concerns about being misled by the prosecution regarding the charges, describing it as a grave injustice. The judge reminded him that he had already pleaded guilty, and the proceedings were concluded. In 1993, Assange provided technical advice and support to assist the Victoria Police Child Exploitation Unit in prosecuting individuals involved in publishing and distributing child pornography. His lawyers emphasized that he was not an informer and received no benefit for his assistance. His role in aiding the police was discussed during his 1996 sentencing on computer hacking charges. This period of his life, including his trial and experiences, is considered formative and played a role in shaping his path toward founding WikiLeaks. In the same year, Assange took on the responsibility of managing Suburbia Public Access Network, one of the first public internet service providers in Australia. He assumed this role after the original owner, Mark Dorset relocated to Sydney. 
During late 1993 or early 1994, Assange became a member of the cypherpunk mailing list. Robert Mann notes that Assange's primary political interest during this time revolved around the information-sharing possibilities of the internet and the associated risks. Assange delved into programming in 1994, where he authored or co-authored various network and encryption programs. One of these creations was the Rubberhose Deniable Encryption System. During this period, Assange also served as a moderator for the Crypto Forum. He managed Best of Security, a website offering advice on computer security, which attracted 5,000 subscribers by 1996. Additionally, he contributed research to Swalit Dreyfuser's book, Underground, 1997, which explored the activities of Australian hackers, including the international subversives. Assange intentionally downplayed his role in the book, aiming to create a sense of community involvement. In 1998, he co-founded Earthman Technology, a company specializing in network intrusion detection technologies. The company was involved in the development of Linux kernel hacking. In the 1990s, Assange, along with Suburbia Public Access Network, played a role in facilitating leaks for various groups, including activists and lawyers. He acted as a conduit for leaked documents while fighting local corruption, serving as a channel for those who wanted to expose misconduct. While he awaited trial and worked to gain custody of his son, Assange and his mother co-founded the activist organization Parent Inquiry into Child Protection. This group used the Australian Freedom of Information Act and recorded meetings with health and community services to obtain information. They also distributed flyers encouraging insiders to come forward anonymously. Assange mentioned having informants inside the organization, including one who leaked a crucial internal departmental manual outlining the rules for custody disputes. In November 1996, Assange sent an email in which he mentioned a project labeled Leaks. He claimed to have registered the domain leaks.org in 1999 but did not take any further action. Assange brought attention to a patent granted to the National Security Agency in August 1999, which described voice data harvesting technology. He expressed concerns about the potential surveillance of overseas phone calls and the transcribing and archiving of this data by foreign spy agencies, stating that this should be a cause for worry. In December 2006, the same month when WikiLeaks published its first leak, Assange authored a five-page essay outlining the thought experiment that underpinned the WikiLeaks strategy. The core idea was to leverage leaks to compel organizations to reduce levels of abuse and dishonesty or pay a secrecy tax to maintain their secrecy but at the cost of inefficiency. Assange elucidated the concept as follows. The more secretive or unjust an organization is, the more leaks induce fear and paranoia in the leadership and planning coterie. This must result in the minimization of efficient internal communications mechanisms, effectively increasing a cognitive secrecy tax. As a consequence, there would be system-wide cognitive decline, resulting in a decreased ability to maintain power when environmental demands require adaptation. Assange, alongside a group of dissidents, mathematicians, and activists, co-founded WikiLeaks in 2006. During this period, Assange became a member of its advisory board and embarked on a series of travels from 2007 to 2010 for WikiLeaks-related activities, visiting regions such as Africa, Asia, Europe, and North America. In December 2007, Assange made influential connections during the Chaos Computer Club conference in Berlin, including individuals like Daniel Domskitberg, Jacob Appelbaum, and the Swedish hosting company PRQ. WikiLeaks, in its early years, published a variety of materials, including internet censorship lists, classified media from anonymous sources, and revelations about events and issues worldwide. Some of the published materials covered topics like drone strikes in Yemen, corruption in the Arab world, extrajudicial executions by Kenyan police, the 2008 Tibetan unrest in China, and the Petrogate oil scandal in Peru. Despite having only four permanent staff members during this period, including Assange and Domskitberg, WikiLeaks relied on a network of volunteers with expertise in various areas. 
Assange sought to engage with established professional media outlets from the beginning, establishing good relations with parts of the German and British press. Notably, a collaboration with Sunday Times journalist John Swain on a report about political killings in Kenya led to increased recognition of WikiLeaks and earned Assange the 2009 Amnesty International New Media Award. WikiLeaks gained international prominence in 2008 when Bank Julius Bauer attempted to prevent the publication of its bank records through a Californian court injunction. This move backfired, drawing global attention to WikiLeaks and its mission to publish material beyond the control of states. By 2009, WikiLeaks had managed to expose the powerful and promote freedom of speech but had not yet achieved the impact Assange had envisioned. In July 2009, Assange released the full report of a commission of inquiry into corruption in the Turks and Caicos Islands, which had been previously suppressed by an injunction. This act demonstrated WikiLeaks' commitment to transparency and its ability to bring hidden information to the public's attention. The release of documents by Chelsea Manning had a significant impact on diplomacy and public opinion worldwide, with responses varying by region. In April 2010, WikiLeaks published a video titled, Collateral Murder, which contained footage of the 12 July 2007 Baghdad airstrike. This video had previously been denied to Reuters under the US Freedom of Information Act. Assange and his team worked diligently to break the US military's encryption of the video. The video shows US soldiers in a helicopter fatally shooting 18 civilians in Iraq, including Reuters journalists Namir Noor al Din and Saeed Kma. In October 2010, WikiLeaks released the Iraq War Logs, a collection of 391,832 United States Army field reports from the Iraq War, covering the period from 2004 to 2009. Assange hoped that this publication would help correct the misinformation that had surrounded the war and its aftermath. Regarding his role within WikiLeaks, Assange acknowledged that he often served as a lightning rod, attracting criticism and attacks to protect the organization's work. He emphasized that it was a challenging role, and he sometimes received undue credit. Assange frequently traveled and took precautions to evade Western intelligence agencies, such as using false names when checking into hotels, sleeping on sofas or floors, and employing encrypted phones and cash transactions. In November 2010, WikiLeaks published approximately a quarter of a million U.S. diplomatic cables, which became known as the Cablegate Files. Initially, WikiLeaks collaborated with established Western media organizations and later with smaller regional media organizations while also releasing the cables themselves. Assange had financial interests in how the information was released, and he conveyed ownership of the information. These cables revealed various aspects of U.S. espionage against the United Nations and world leaders, tensions between the U.S. and its allies, and instances of corruption documented by U.S. diplomats worldwide. The release of these cables is considered to have played a role in sparking the Arab Spring. In March 2010, a WikiLeaks member believed to be Julian Assange, using the pseudonym Ox, engaged in a text chat conversation with Chelsea Manning while she was submitting leaks to WikiLeaks. The US government later referred to these chat logs in the 2018 indictment of Julian Assange. They filed an affidavit claiming that Assange's identity was discerned from the chats through hints he provided, and Manning identified him as Assange to Adrian Lamo. During the chat logs, Manning asked Assange about his ability to crack LM hash passwords. Assange confirmed his proficiency in this area and discussed the use of rainbow tables for cracking hashes and discovering associated passwords. An FBI agent involved in the case against Assange argued that this exchange implied an illegal agreement to assist in password cracking. Assange also informed Manning that WikiLeaks possessed for months worth of telephone calls from the Icelandic parliament, stating that the Nixon tapes have nothing on us. When Manning mentioned that she had no further submissions for WikiLeaks, Assange responded, Curious eyes never run dry in my experience. During her court-martial, Manning explained that she downloaded the detainee assessment briefs, DABs, for Guantanamo Bay after a discussion with a WikiLeaks member via a secure online chat log. In the conversation, Manning inquired about the DABs, 
and although Assange did not consider them politically significant, he believed they could contribute to the general historical account of events at Guantanamo Bay. After this exchange, Manning decided to download the DAB data. In 2011, a series of events led to the compromise of a WikiLeaks file containing the leaked U.S. diplomatic cables. In August 2010, Julian Assange gave Guardian journalist David Lee an encryption key and a URL where he could access the full file. In February 2011, David Lee and Luke Harding of The Guardian published the encryption key in their book, WikiLeaks, Inside Julian Assange's War on Secrecy. Lee believed the key was temporary and would expire within days. WikiLeaks supporters shared the encrypted files on mirror sites in December 2010 after WikiLeaks experienced cyber attacks. When WikiLeaks became aware of this, they informed the U.S. State Department. On 25 August 2011, the German magazine Der Freitag published an article with details that would allow people to piece together the information. On 1 September 2011, WikiLeaks announced that they would make the unredacted cables public and searchable. The decision to publish the cables was made by Assange alone, and this decision was criticized by The Guardian and its previous media partners. Glenn Greenwald argued that releasing all the cables was the best and safest course to ensure that the information was widely available and that steps could be taken to protect sources. The U.S. established an Information Review Task Force, IRTF, to investigate the impact of WikiLeaks publications. According to IRTF reports, the leaks were assessed to have the potential to cause serious damage and put foreign U.S. sources at risk. However, the head of the IRTF, Brigadier General Robert Carr, testified at Chelsea Manning's sentencing hearing that the task force found no examples of anyone losing their life due to WikiLeaks' publication of the documents. This testimony raised questions about the argument that WikiLeaks' publications put lives at risk. In the request for Assange's extradition to the US, the government cited the release of unredacted cables, claiming that Assange's actions had put lives at risk. John Young, the owner and operator of the website Cryptum, testified at Assange's extradition hearing, stating that Cryptum had published the unredacted cables on September 1, the day before WikiLeaks, and they remain on the Cryptum site. Young also noted that no U.S. law enforcement authority had notified him that this publication of the cables was illegal or criminal in any way. Lawyers for Assange provided evidence that they believed would demonstrate Assange's efforts to protect lives in the release of the cables. During the 2011 Egyptian Revolution, when then-President Hosni Mubarak attempted to close mobile phone networks, Julian Assange and others at WikiLeaks reportedly hacked into Nortel and fought against Mubarak's official hackers to reverse the network shutdown. In the years following, WikiLeaks continued to publish significant leaks, including the Guantanamo Bay files, the Syria files, the Kissinger cables, and the Saudi cables. As of July 2015, Assange stated that WikiLeaks had published more than 10 million documents and associated analyses, describing it as a giant library of the world's most persecuted documents. In terms of legal issues in Australia, Australia's Attorney General, Robert McClelland, released a statement on 2 September 2011, suggesting that the US diplomatic cables published by WikiLeaks had identified at least one ASIO, Australian Security Intelligence Organization, officer. McClellan stated that it was a crime in Australia to publish information that could identify an intelligence officer, and he mentioned that Julian Assange could face prosecution in Australia. In 2014, WikiLeaks published information about political bribery allegations that violated a gag order in Australia, which raised the possibility of legal consequences for Assange if he were to return to the country. After WikiLeaks released the Manning material, United States authorities initiated investigations into WikiLeaks and Julian Assange with the intention of prosecuting them under the Espionage Act of 1917. In November 2010, U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder confirmed the existence of an active, ongoing criminal investigation into WikiLeaks. Legal documents leaked during the following months revealed that a federal grand jury in Alexandria, Virginia, was conducting the investigation and the U.S. administration encouraged its allies to open criminal investigations into Assange. In 2010, 
the FBI told a lawyer for Assange that he wasn't the subject of an investigation. However, in the same year, the NSA added Assange to its manhunting timeline, an annual record of efforts to capture or eliminate alleged terrorists and other targets. In 2011, the NSA discussed categorizing WikiLeaks as a malicious foreign actor for surveillance purposes. In August 2011, WikiLeaks volunteer Sigurdr Thordeson, working in Iceland, contacted the FBI and became an informant, providing the FBI with hard drives he had copied from Assange and other core WikiLeaks members. In December 2011, chat logs between Chelsea Manning and someone alleged to be Assange were revealed by prosecutors during Manning's court-martial. Assange argued that WikiLeaks has no way of knowing the identity of its sources and that the chats with sources were anonymous. He also described the allegation that WikiLeaks had conspired with Manning as absolute nonsense. The chat logs were presented as evidence during Manning's court-martial. Diplomatic cables released in 2012 between Australia and the United States indicated that the US government was investigating Assange, considering a range of charges, including espionage and conspiracy. However, diplomats dismissed claims that the investigation was politically motivated. Under the Obama administration, the Department of Justice did not indict Assange due to an inability to find evidence distinguishing his actions from those of a journalist. During the Trump administration, CIA Director Mike Pompo and Attorney General Jeff Sessions intensified their pursuit of Assange to learn more about WikiLeaks' interactions with Russian intelligence and other activities. Negotiations involving potential immunity in exchange for Assange's testimony were halted following the Vault 7 disclosures. In April 2017, U.S. officials were preparing to file formal charges against Assange. His indictment was unsealed in 2019 and was later expanded in 2019 and 2020. The special counsel's office, led by Robert Mueller, considered charging WikiLeaks or Assange as conspirators in a computer intrusion conspiracy in early 2019, but there were factual uncertainties regarding Assange's role in the hacks and distribution. These uncertainties remained the subject of ongoing investigations by the U.S. Attorney's Office. Julian Assange faced sexual assault allegations in Sweden in August 2010. Two women who volunteered with WikiLeaks accused him of sexual assault. On 30 August 2010, Assange was questioned by the Stockholm police regarding the allegations, which he denied. The preliminary investigation was initially discontinued, but public prosecutor Marianne N.Y. decided to resume it on 1 September 2010, involving all the original allegations. Assange left Sweden on 27 September 2010, and an international warrant for his arrest in absence was issued the same day. In November 2010, the Swedish police issued an international arrest warrant for Assange. During this time, Assange made critical comments about the Swedish judicial system, suggesting it was influenced by radical feminist ideology. Interpol issued a red notice for his arrest in November 2010. On 8 December 2010, Assange surrendered to British police and attended his first extradition hearing, where he was remanded in custody. He was granted bail on 16 December 2010, after his supporters paid £240,000 in cash and shorties. Subsequent legal proceedings in the UK ruled that Assange should be extradited to Sweden. Assange expressed his willingness to go to Sweden if provided with a diplomatic guarantee that he would not be extradited to the United States, a request that the Swedish Foreign Ministry denied, stating that their legislation did not allow for such a guarantee. Assange's lawyers invited the Swedish prosecutor for times to come and question him at the embassy, but these offers were refused. In 2013, the Swedish prosecutor intended to withdraw the European arrest warrant and revoke the detention order citing the actions as disproportionate to the costs and seriousness of the crime. However, the CPS tried to dissuade her from doing so. The UK later agreed to an interview with Assange in the Ecuadorian embassy, with several restrictions. The investigation was eventually discontinued by the Swedish authorities in May 2017, citing communication difficulties with Assange in the Ecuadorian embassy.
They officially revoked his arrest warrant but left open the possibility of resuming the investigation if Assange visited Sweden before August 2020. Following Assange's arrest in April 2019, the case was reopened in May 2019 by prosecutor Eva Marie Persson. However, on 19 November 2019, she announced that she had discontinued her investigation, citing a considerable weakening of the evidence due to the elapsed time. Julian Assange entered the Ecuadorian embassy in London on 19 June 2012, seeking political asylum. At that time, Ecuadorian Foreign Minister Ricardo Patino announced that Assange had applied for asylum and that the government was considering his request. To accommodate Assange, a small office within the embassy was converted into a studio apartment equipped with essential amenities, including a bed, telephone, sun lamp, computer, shower, treadmill, and kitchenette. Assange was confined to a relatively small space of about 330 square feet. The toilet in the women's bathroom was removed at Assange's request, allowing him to have a quieter space for sleeping. Assange sought asylum in the embassy because he believed that the sexual assault allegations in Sweden were designed to discredit him and potentially lead to his extradition to the United States, where he might face charges related to WikiLeaks activities. Assange's presence in the embassy created a diplomatic standoff, as he faced arrest by British authorities if he left the embassy premises due to his breach of bail conditions. Supporters of Assange, including notable figures like Jemima Goldsmith, John Pilger, and Ken Loach, forfeited significant amounts of money that they had provided as sureties for his bail. The UK government claimed the right to arrest Assange inside the embassy, leading to tension with Ecuador. Officers from the Metropolitan Police Service were stationed outside the embassy from June 2012 to October 2015 to arrest Assange if he left the embassy. These officers were withdrawn in 2015 due to the costs associated with their presence. In August 2012, Ecuador granted Assange political asylum, citing concerns about a potential US investigation against him and the importance of protecting freedom of expression and freedom of the press. Assange remained in the Ecuadorian embassy, where he lived in asylum while the diplomatic standoff persisted. Julian Assange stood as a candidate for the Australian Senate in the 2013 Australian federal election in the state of Victoria. He launched the WikiLeaks Party, a political party founded on the principles of transparency and government accountability, in conjunction with his candidacy. Assange's decision to run for the Senate was influenced by what he perceived as attacks on WikiLeaks by then Prime Minister Julia Gillard. He believed that if he were to win a Senate seat, it might lead to the termination of the US grand jury investigation against him and prompt the British government to do the same. During his campaign, Assange identified himself as a libertarian. He expressed his commitment to using parliamentary privilege to overcome court-imposed gag orders and emphasized the importance of protecting individuals and small businesses from the influence of large corporations and government. He also acknowledged that there were diverse perspectives on issues such as euthanasia and same-sex marriage. The WikiLeaks party experienced internal disagreements over issues of governance and electoral strategies, including a controversial preference deal in the 2013 election. Leaked emails suggested that Assange played a central role in the preference deal and sought to grant himself veto rights, exerting influence over the party's national council and even proposing that he should become the party's president, although this position did not exist under the party's constitution. The 2013 election did not result in Assange winning a Senate seat, and the WikiLeaks party faced challenges. Assange expressed a willingness to run for a Senate seat in the future and reiterated his commitment to the party, which he envisioned as a continuing political force. He initially indicated a plan to contest the 2014 special election in Western Australia, but the Australian Electoral Commission ultimately ruled him ineligible. The party's registration was later revoked due to low membership numbers in 2015. In 2013, Julian Assange and WikiLeaks played a role in assisting whistleblower Edward Snowden in escaping from U.S. law enforcement. After the United States revoked Snowden's passport, leaving him stranded in Russia, Assange and his associates explored options for transporting Snowden to Latin America on the private jet of a sympathetic Latin American leader. 
To divert attention from their real plans, they discussed the use of the jet of the Bolivian president Evo Morales, rather than the one they were actually considering. As a result of these discussions, in July 2013, Morales' official jet was forced to land in Austria after the US pressured several European countries to deny it access to their airspace based on false rumors that Snowden was on board. This incident led to international controversy and diplomatic tensions. Assange characterized the incident as revealing the true nature of the relationship between Western Europe and the United States, highlighting that a mere phone call from US intelligence authorities was enough to close the airspace to a diplomatic flight. Assange advised Snowden that seeking asylum in Russia would provide him with the safest protection, as Russia was better equipped to defend its borders than countries like Venezuela, Brazil, or Ecuador. In 2015, Maria Luisa Ramos, the Bolivian ambassador to Russia, accused Assange of jeopardizing Morales' life by using the Bolivian president's jet as a diversion. Assange expressed regret for what had occurred but asserted that it was impossible to predict that other countries would engage in such an unprecedented operation. Additionally, Assange commented on Operation Speargun, which was revealed in documents provided by Edward Snowden. These documents disclosed that the New Zealand government had been working to establish a secret mass surveillance program known as Operation Speargun. During a remote video appearance at a town hall meeting in Auckland while campaigning for Kim.com, Assange noted that the Snowden documents indicated he had been a target of the program. He described Operation Speargun as an extreme and Orwellian development being secretly constructed in New Zealand. In 2014, the company responsible for monitoring Assange in the embassy warned the Ecuadorian government that he was intercepting and gathering information from the embassy and its staff. They also claimed that Assange had compromised the embassy's communications system. WikiLeaks denied these allegations. A UC Global report from November 2014 suggested that a listening device had been found in a room occupied by Assange. According to the report, this discovery strengthened suspicions that Assange was eavesdropping on diplomatic personnel to obtain privileged information that could help maintain his status in the embassy. Ecuadorian Ambassador Forkany mentioned that Assange had been evasive when questioned about the briefcase. On 3 July 2015, an open letter from Assange to French President François Hollande was published by the Paris newspaper Le Monde. In the letter, Assange urged the French government to grant him refugee status. President Hollande responded by stating that France could not act on Assange's request, as his situation did not present an immediate danger. In September 2016 and again on 12 January 2017, WikiLeaks tweeted that if President Obama granted clemency to Chelsea Manning, Assange would agree to US extradition. Following the commutation of Manning's sentence on 17 January 2017, Obama stated that Assange's offer had not influenced the decision. WikiLeaks, however, tweeted that Assange was still happy to agree to extradition if his rights were respected despite Obama's statement. Assange suggested that the clemency for Manning was an attempt to make his life difficult and make him appear untruthful. Although there was pressure on Assange to accept extradition, he eventually backed away from the offer. Lawyers representing WikiLeaks, Melinda Taylor and Barry Pollock, indicated that the clemency did not meet Assange's conditions, and they believed Manning should have been released immediately. On 19 May 2017, Assange appeared on the embassy's balcony and told the crowd that despite no longer facing a Swedish sex investigation, he would remain inside the embassy to avoid potential extradition to the United States. During the 2016 US presidential campaign, Julian Assange was critical of both major candidates, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. In February 2016, Assange expressed his concerns about Clinton, stating that, Hillary lacks judgment and will push the United States into endless, stupid wars which spread terrorism, she certainly should not become President of the United States. Before the election, Assange was approached by Alexander Nix, the CEO of Cambridge Analytica, about releasing missing Clinton emails. Assange rejected the request, preferring to handle the matter independently. In an Election Day statement, Assange criticized both Democratic and Republican candidates for expressing hostility towards whistleblowers. 
On the 22nd of July 2016, WikiLeaks released emails and documents from the Democratic National Committee, DNC, revealing efforts to undermine Bernie Sanders and showing apparent favoritism towards Clinton. The release led to the resignation of DNC chairwoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz and an apology to Sanders from the DNC. According to the New York Times, Assange timed the release to coincide with the 2016 Democratic National Convention because he believed that Clinton had pushed for his indictment and regarded her as a liberal war hawk. On October 7, WikiLeaks began publishing emails from Clinton campaign chairman John Podester. On 15 October, the Ecuadorian government temporarily severed Assange's internet connection because of election interference. Surveillance reports indicated that on 19 October, Assange's associates removed boxes and hard drives from the embassy. In November 2017, WikiLeaks asked Donald Trump Jr. to share a WikiLeaks tweet containing a quote about Assange being droned, allegedly made by Hillary Clinton. After the election, WikiLeaks requested that President-elect Trump encourage Australia to appoint Assange as ambassador to the US. Assange repeated this offer publicly, suggesting that he could open an embassy-style facility in DC for whistleblowers. Cybersecurity experts attributed the DNC server breach to the Russian government, and 12 Russian GRU military intelligence agents were later indicted for the attack. The Mueller report revealed that Guchifer 2.0, an online persona, shared the hacked emails with WikiLeaks and others. The Senate Intelligence Committee stated that WikiLeaks actively participated in the Russian intelligence campaign, although Assange maintained that the Russian government was not the source of the DNC and Podesta emails. In various interviews, Assange insisted that the Clinton campaign's accusations of Russian involvement were exaggerated, and he criticized it for a neo-McCarthy hysteria. Assange also clarified that WikiLeaks publishers' material of political, diplomatic, historical, or ethical importance, regardless of its source, and had never received original information on Trump's campaign. In a July 2016 interview on Dutch television, Julian Assange hinted that DNC staffer Seth Rich was the source of the DNC emails and suggested that Rich had been killed as a result. When asked about Rich's killing, Assange stated that it was not a simple murder, implying a link to the DNC email leak. WikiLeaks subsequently offered a $20,000 reward for information about Seth Rich's murder. They clarified that the reward did not imply that Rich was a source for WikiLeaks or that his murder was connected to their publications. Assange's comments in this interview sparked significant attention and conspiracy theories regarding Seth Rich's murder. However, according to the Mueller investigation, Assange's implication that Rich was the source was false. Instead, it was an attempt to obscure the fact that the source was Russian military intelligence. The investigation also suggested that Assange received the emails when Seth Rich was already deceased and continued to coordinate the release of the material with the Russian hackers. In later years at the embassy, Julian Assange faced various challenges and developments. Vault 7 release. In March 2017, WikiLeaks began releasing a large cache of CIA documents, referred to as Vault 7. These documents exposed the CIA's hacking capabilities and software tools used to breach various electronic devices. In response to this release, CIA Director Mike Pompo labeled WikiLeaks as a non-state hostile intelligence service. Assassination and kidnapping plans, it was reported that in the wake of the Vault 7 leaks, there were discussions within the CIA about potentially kidnapping or even assassinating Julian Assange. However, it was not confirmed that these extreme measures were approved. Support for Reality Winner In June 2017, Assange expressed support for NSA leaker Reality Winner, who had been arrested for leaking classified documents. Alleged pardon offer In August 2017, U.S. Republican Congressman Donna Rorabasher visited Assange at the embassy and conveyed an offer that President Trump might pardon him if he agreed to state that Russia was not involved in the 2016 Democratic National Committee email leaks. Both Trump and Rorabasher later denied having discussed the offer. Involvement in Catalonia Independence Assange became involved in the Catalonia Independence Movement, acting as its chief international spokesman. 
He used social media to support the movement and offered assistance, including providing instructions on how to communicate securely. This led to tensions between the Spanish and Ecuadorian governments. Ecuadorian citizenship and diplomatic status. In December 2017, Ecuador granted Assange citizenship and approved a special designation that would allow him to work at the Ecuadorian embassy in Russia. However, this was later revoked over unpaid fees and inconsistencies in naturalization papers. Social media and communications restrictions. In 2018, Assange faced restrictions on his internet and communication access. His internet was temporarily disconnected in March 2018 after he criticized Germany's arrest of Catalonian separatist leader Carles Puigdemont. Ecuador later partially restored his communications in October 2018. Legal actions. Assange initiated legal actions to have the UK drop the arrest warrant against him, arguing that it was no longer proportionate. However, these attempts were unsuccessful. UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention In December 2018, the UN's Working Group on Arbitrary Detention called on the UK to allow Assange to leave the embassy freely. Support from public figures Assange received support from individuals like Pamela Anderson and the Parliament of Geneva, who called for his defence and asylum. Throughout this period, Assange's situation remained highly complex and controversial, with ongoing tensions between the UK, Ecuador, and the United States. Julian Assange was subjected to extensive surveillance while he was in the Ecuadorian embassy in London. WikiLeaks discovery of surveillance. In April 2019, WikiLeaks revealed that an extensive surveillance operation had been conducted against Assange from within the embassy. The surveillance included various materials like videos, audio recordings, copies of private legal documents, and a medical report. These materials had emerged in Spain, and it was reported that unidentified individuals in Madrid had attempted extortion related to this surveillance. CIA surveillance via UC Global a report by the Spanish newspaper El País in September 2019 exposed that a Spanish defense and security company called Undercover Global SL, UC Global, had spied on Assange on behalf of the CIA while he was in the embassy. UC Global had initially been contracted to provide security for the embassy. Surveillance details, the report revealed that UC Global's owner, David Morales, had provided the CIA with audio and video recordings of Assange's meetings with his lawyers and colleagues. Morales had also facilitated direct access for the US to the video camera feed within the embassy starting in December 2017. Legal Complaint Julian Assange had filed a complaint against UC Global, alleging violations of his privacy, attorney-client privileges, as well as misappropriation, bribery, money laundering, and more. Spanish investigation. Following Assange's complaint, Spain's High Court initiated a secret investigation into David Morales and his links with US intelligence. UK denial of Assange's testimony. In September 2019, Spanish Judge Jose de la Mata requested permission from British authorities to question Assange via video conference as a witness in the case against Morales. The United Kingdom Central Authority, UCR, provisionally denied this request and raised objections. However, Spanish judicial bodies believed that the UK's concerns were linked to the potential impact of the Spanish case on Assange's extradition process to the US. Access to surveillance materials. In a November 2019 article, journalist Svenia Morizzi claimed to have access to some of the surveillance materials, including videos, audios, and photos showing various meetings and events within the embassy. The surveillance was believed to be on behalf of the US government and might be used to support Assange's extradition case. Testimony and lawsuit. Assange was eventually allowed to testify to the Spanish judge via video link in December 2019. He stated that he was unaware that the surveillance included audio recordings and suggested that the surveillance was likely directed at his legal team. In August 2022, Four of Assange's American lawyers and journalists filed a lawsuit against the CIA, Mike Pompo, UC Global, and David Morales over the surveillance.
These revelations underscored the extent of the surveillance that Assange experienced while seeking asylum in the Ecuadorian embassy and raised significant concerns about the violation of privacy, attorney-client privileges, and potential interference in his legal defense and extradition case. Julian Assange's arrest in the Ecuadorian embassy and the subsequent events leading to the termination of his asylum are as follows. Violation of Asylum Terms In April 2019, Ecuadorian President Lenin Moreno accused Julian Assange of violating the terms of his asylum. This accusation followed the release of photos linking President Moreno to a corruption scandal. Assange and WikiLeaks argued that they were merely reporting on a corruption investigation against Moreno initiated by Ecuador's legislature. Expulsion Agreement It was reported that due to the controversy surrounding the corruption allegations and to secure a loan from the International Monetary Fund, IMF, an agreement had been reached within the Ecuadorian government to expel Assange from the embassy and hand him over to the UK authorities. Metropolitan Police's Arrest on the 11th of April 2019, the Ecuadorian government invited the Metropolitan Police into the embassy, leading to Assange's arrest. He was taken into custody by UK authorities on charges related to his failure to surrender to bail in the UK in 2012. Additionally, the arrest was made on the basis of a US extradition warrant. Assange's Threat It was revealed that an audio recording captured Assange making threats to Ambassador Jamie Merchant suggesting that he had a panic button that could trigger devastating consequences for the embassy in the event of his arrest. Ecuadorian authorities informed British officials of this threat to ensure a safe arrest operation. Ecuador's accusations Ecuadorian authorities accused Assange of various behaviors that contributed to the termination of his asylum, including installing electronic distortion equipment in the embassy, interfering with security cameras, mistreating embassy guards, and accessing security files without permission. Withdrawal of asylum, President Moreno announced that Ecuador was withdrawing Assange's asylum due to his interference in Ecuador's domestic affairs and international politics. Moreno stated that the patience of Ecuador had run out in light of Assange's actions and their impact on other states. These events marked the end of Julian Assange's asylum in the Ecuadorian embassy and initiated a legal process related to his arrest and potential extradition to the United States. Julian Assange's conviction for breaching the Bail Act 1976 and subsequent legal developments are outlined as follows. Charge and guilty verdict. On the day of his arrest in April 2019, Assange was charged with breaching the Bail Act 1976. He was quickly found guilty of this charge during a brief hearing. Bias allegations against Chief Magistrate Assange's defense team argued that Chief Magistrate Emmer Abuthnet, who presided over his case, was biased against him. They claimed that her husband, James Abuthnet, had financial links to institutions and individuals exposed by WikiLeaks. Additionally, the Intercept reported that her husband and son had connections to people cited for criminal activities in documents published by WikiLeaks, as well as ties to the intelligence services and defense industries. Response by Judge In response to the allegations of bias, Judge Michael Snow stated that it was unacceptable to air such claims in court, and he criticized Assange's behavior, describing him as a narcissist who couldn't look beyond his own interests. Judge Snow emphasized that Assange's assertions about a senior judge not having the courage to be cross-examined were not evidence in a legal sense. Sentencing and prison Following the guilty verdict, Assange was remanded to Belmarsh Prison. On 1 May 2019, he was sentenced to 50 weeks of imprisonment. The judge announced that he would be released after serving half of his sentence, provided that there were no other proceedings and no further offenses committed. UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention The United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detention expressed concerns about the verdict, suggesting that it contravened principles of necessity and proportionality for what they considered a minor violation of bail conditions. Appeal and Withdrawal Assange initially appealed his sentence. However, he later decided to drop his appeal in July. These legal proceedings stemmed from Assange's arrest and were related to his breach of bail conditions in the UK. The subsequent legal battles focused on the fairness of the trial and sentencing. Julian Assange's indictment in the United States 
along with the associated legal developments and reactions, is summarized as follows. Sealed indictment. In 2012 and 2013, U.S. officials indicated that Assange was not named in a sealed indictment. However, on 6 March 2018, a federal grand jury in the Eastern District of Virginia issued a sealed indictment against Assange. This sealed indictment remained undisclosed for some time. Revelation of indictment. In November 2018, U.S. prosecutors inadvertently revealed the existence of the sealed indictment. Subpoena to Chelsea Manning. In February 2019, Chelsea Manning was subpoenaed to appear before a grand jury in Virginia regarding the case. Manning criticized the secrecy of the proceedings and refused to testify, resulting in her being jailed for contempt of court in March 2019. Unsealing of Assange's indictment. On the 11th of April 2019, the same day as Assange's arrest in London, the indictment against him was unsealed. He was charged with conspiracy to commit computer intrusion related to an alleged attempt to help Chelsea Manning crack a password hash to download classified documents under a different username. Additional Espionage Act charges. On the 23rd of May 2019, Assange was indicted on 17 new charges related to the Espionage Act of 1917. These charges included conspiracy to obtain and disclose national defense information, conspiracy to commit computer intrusions, obtaining national defense information, and disclosure of national defense information. The maximum sentence for these charges totaled 170 years in prison. Expanding the case, in June 2019, the U.S. Department of Justice introduced new allegations, claiming that Assange had recruited and conspired with hackers to obtain information for WikiLeaks. These allegations suggested that Assange had provided a list of hacking targets. Legal and ethical debates, Assange's indictment raised concerns about media freedom and its impact on journalism. Some experts and organizations argued that the charges could have broader implications for investigative journalism and press freedom, as Assange's actions were factually different but legally similar to what professional journalists do. Varied reactions, the responses to Assange's arrest and indictment varied widely. While some American journalism institutions and politicians supported Assange's arrest and indictment, several press freedom organizations, academics, and campaigners viewed it as an attack on freedom of the press and international law. International concerns, human rights organizations, UN experts, and various international entities expressed concerns that the prosecution of Assange could set a dangerous precedent and jeopardize media freedom. These developments reflected the evolving legal and ethical debates surrounding Assange's indictment and its potential implications for journalism and freedom of the press. Since his arrest on the 11th of April 2019, Julian Assange has been held in HM Prison Belmarsh in London. During his imprisonment, several developments have occurred. UN Special Rapporteur's Assessment UN Special Rapporteur Nils Melzer visited Assange in prison on 9 May 2019. He reported that Assange showed signs of psychological torture due to prolonged exposure to extreme stress, chronic anxiety, and intense psychological trauma. The British government expressed disagreement with some of Melzer's observations. Judicial Ruling on 13 September 2019, District Judge Vanessa Barretza ruled that Assange would not be released when his prison term ended on of September. She cited concerns about him being a flight risk and stated that his status would change from a serving prisoner to a person facing extradition when his sentence concluded. Deteriorating Health In November 2019, Melzer expressed concern about Assange's deteriorating health and the risk to his life. He criticized the UK government for not taking action to address the issue. On 30 December 2019, Melzer accused the UK government of subjecting Assange to psychological torture and other cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. Political and medical intervention In February 2020, Australian MPs Andrew Wilkie and George Christensen visited Assange and urged the UK and Australian governments to intervene and prevent his extradition. Concerns about Assange's health and detention conditions were raised by members of the medical profession who signed petitions on his behalf. 
COVID-19 Concerns On 25 March 2020, Judge Barretzer denied Assange's bail request, despite arguments from his lawyers that his imprisonment put him at high risk of contracting COVID-19. She cited Assange's past conduct and efforts to avoid extradition. International Support and Resolutions In September 2020, an open letter in support of Assange was sent to UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson, signed by the presidents of Argentina and Venezuela, and around 160 other politicians. US representatives Chelsea Gabbard and Thomas Massey introduced a bipartisan resolution opposing Assange's extradition the following month. In December 2020, German Human Rights Commissioner Barbel Kofler emphasized the need to consider Assange's physical and mental health before deciding on his extradition. UN Special Rapporteur Nils Melzer appealed to British authorities to release Assange after a decade of what he considered arbitrary detention. These developments underscore the ongoing concerns about Julian Assange's health and the conditions of his detention while his extradition case unfolds. The hearings on Julian Assange's extradition to the United States were a complex and contentious process with several key developments. Initial hearing and extradition order, the first hearing took place on 2 May 2019, in London. When asked about his consent to extradition, Assange expressed his opposition, emphasizing that he considered his actions as journalism. On 13 June 2019, British Home Secretary Sajid Javid signed the extradition order. Change of presiding judge In late 2019, Judge Emmer Abutnit stepped aside from presiding over the extradition hearings due to concerns about the perception of bias arising from her family's connections to intelligence services and defence industries. Vanessa Barretzer was appointed as the new presiding judge. Assange's statements in court during a case management hearing on 21 October 2019, Assange expressed his concerns about the proceedings, citing issues related to fairness, the resources available to the US government, and privacy violations. He also claimed that journalists and whistleblowers were being treated as enemies of the people. Legal arguments and delays, legal arguments were presented in February 2020. Assange's defense argued that he should not be extradited for political offenses. The hearings experienced significant delays due to various requests and the COVID-19 pandemic. International condemnation. In March, the International Bar Association's Human Rights Institute, IBRI, condemned the treatment of Assange in the extradition trial. Espionage indictment. In September 2020, Assange faced the espionage indictment with 18 counts in court. The judge denied motions by his barristers to dismiss the charges or to adjourn for better preparation. Some witnesses testified remotely due to COVID-19 restrictions, and technical issues caused delays. Testimonies emphasized the high risk of depression and suicide due to the conditions of imprisonment, especially given Assange's Asperger syndrome. New allegations and conclusion Testimony revealed allegations related to the surveillance of the Ecuadorian embassy by UC Global, with claims of discussions about kidnapping or poisoning Assange. Hearings concluded on 1 October 2020, with a statement in support of the defense by Noam Chomsky. Extradition decision On 4 January 2021, Judge Barretzer ruled that Assange could not be extradited to the United States due to concerns about his mental health and the risk of suicide in a U.S. prison. However, she sided with the U.S. government on other points, including the classification of charges as non-political offenses and the application of freedom of speech protections. This decision marked a significant point in the legal battle over Assange's extradition, with various aspects of the case generating substantial debate and controversy. Julian Assange's legal journey has been marked by numerous appeals, developments, and legal decisions. Here are the key events. Denial of bail. On 6 January 2021, Assange was denied bail pending an appeal by the United States. This decision was based on the grounds that he was considered a flight risk. U.S. Prosecution Appeal. On 15 January 2021, U.S. prosecutors appealed against the denial of Assange's extradition to the United States. Assurances by the Biden administration, 
In July 2021, following the ruling that it would be oppressive to extradite Assange to the US, the Biden administration assured that Assange would not be subjected to special administrative measures, SAMs, or imprisonment at ADX, a supermaximum security prison, unless he committed actions that warranted such measures. They also offered to allow him to serve any custodial sentence in his home country, Australia. Revelations by witness Cy Gerder in Jai Thordeson. In June 2021, an interview with Cy Gerder in Jai Thordeson, a key witness in the US case against Assange, was published. Thordeson had received immunity in exchange for cooperating with the FBI. In the interview, he admitted to fabricating allegations used in the US indictment. Revocation of Ecuadorian Citizenship In July 2021, Ecuador revoked Assange's citizenship. High Court Ruling In August 2021, the High Court ruled that the initial judge may have given undue weight to a misleading report by a defense expert witness. This opened the door to considering the contested risk of suicide in the appeal. High Court Appeal Hearings In October 2021, the High Court held a two-day appeal hearing. The U.S. argued that Assange's health issues were less severe than initially claimed and highlighted binding assurances regarding his proposed treatment in U.S. custody. The defense expressed concerns about the reliability of these assurances. High Court Extradition Approval On 10 December 2021, the High Court ruled in favor of the United States, allowing the extradition. The case was remitted to the Home Secretary for the final decision. Supreme Court Appeal Permission On 24 January 2022, Assange was granted permission to petition the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom for an appeal hearing. However, in March 2022, the Supreme Court refused the appeal, stating that Assange had not raised an arguable point of law. NFT Auction for Legal Defense In February 2022, an NFT artwork auction raised funds for Assange's legal defense. The artwork, called Clock, was bought by a decentralized autonomous organization, DAO, called Assange DAO. Home Secretary's approval of extradition. On 17 June 2022, Home Secretary Preeti Patel approved Assange's extradition to the United States. High Court Appeal. On 1 July 2022, Assange lodged an appeal against the extradition in the High Court. Perfected Grounds of Appeal On the 22nd of August 2022, Assange's legal team lodged perfected grounds of appeal challenging the previous decision. European Court of Human Rights Appeal Assange also made an appeal to the European Court of Human Rights, which was declared inadmissible in December 2022. International Support and Plea Deal Discussions in April and May 2023, several European unions, associations of journalists, and international organizations expressed support for Assange's release and called for the dropping of charges. In May 2023, Assange's legal team expressed openness to a plea deal, though they maintained that no crime had been committed. High Court Dismissal On 6 June 2023, the High Court in London dismissed Assange's appeal, stating that none of the grounds of appeal raised any properly arguable point. U.S. Ambassador's mention of a plea deal On 14 August 2023, it was reported that the U.S. Ambassador to Australia had flagged a potential plea deal for Assange. These developments reflect the ongoing legal complexities and international attention surrounding Julian Assange's case. Julian Assange has been involved in various writings, talk shows, and expressed his opinions on a range of topics. Here are some of his notable contributions and opinions. World Tomorrow Show In 2012, Assange hosted the World Tomorrow Show, which was broadcast by the Russian network RT. The show featured interviews and discussions with various guests on topics of global significance. Writings State and Terrorist Conspiracies 2006 Assange wrote about the relationships between state and non-state actors in conspiracies. Conspiracy as Governance 2006 This piece explored the concept of conspiracy as a mode of governance. The Hidden Curse of Thomas Paine 2008 Assange discussed the legacy of Thomas Paine and its implications. 
What's new about WikiLeaks? 2011 In this piece, Assange reflected on the role and impact of WikiLeaks. Forward to Cypherpunks, 2012 Assange contributed the foreword to the book, Cypherpunks, which is primarily a transcript of a discussion between Assange and others. In the foreword, he expressed concerns about the transformation of the internet into a tool for totalitarianism. Libertarian views, in 2010, Assange described himself as a libertarian and stated that WikiLeaks was designed to make capitalism more free and ethical. Autobiography, in 2010, Assange secured a deal for his autobiography worth at least $1.3 million. However, he disavowed the published autobiography, titled Julian Assange, the unauthorized autobiography, stating that he did not consider himself the writer of the book. He accused the publisher of breaching their contract by publishing an uncorrected draft against his wishes. When Google Met WikiLeaks, Assange's book When Google Met WikiLeaks, published in 2014, recounts a meeting between Assange and Google CEO Eric Schmidt. It explores their discussions and interactions. Response to criticisms, Assange responded to criticism and allegations, such as those published in Private Eye, by defending his organization and its values. He addressed claims of conspiracy theories and expressed gratitude for support from various groups, including Jewish supporters. These writings, interviews, and responses reflect Assange's thoughts on transparency, governance, and his experiences with the media and publishing. His work has generated significant debate and controversy over the years. Julian Assange's personal life has been a subject of public interest and scrutiny. Here are some key aspects of his personal life. Marriage and family. Assange married a woman named Teresa when he was still a teenager. They had a son named Daniel in 1989. The couple went through a separation and a custody dispute over Daniel until 1999. According to Assange's mother, his hair reportedly turned white during the time of the custody dispute. Dating Profile In 2006, Assange created a dating profile on the website OkCupid using the username Harry Harrison, the name of a science fiction writer. In the profile, he described himself as a passionate activist intellectual working on a human rights project. Children Assange mentioned in emails and public statements that he had fathered several children. In 2015, he revealed that he had another child, his youngest, who was French. He also stated that his family faced death threats and harassment due to his work. Relationship with Stella Maris In 2015, Assange began a relationship with Stella Maurice, his South African-born lawyer. They became engaged in 2017 and have two sons born in 2017 and 2019. Maurice revealed their relationship in 2020 due to concerns for Assange's safety and well-being. The couple faced challenges, including legal actions against UK government officials to allow them to marry while Assange was in prison. They were eventually married in Belmarsh Prison in 2022. Julian Assange's personal life has been intertwined with his work, activism, and legal challenges, which have attracted significant attention from the media and the public. Assessments of Assange's work and actions vary widely, with some praising his efforts to expose government secrets and promote transparency, while others have criticized him for the manner in which he has carried out his activities. Public figures, Journalists, politicians, and activists have expressed a wide range of views on Assange, from describing him as a whistleblower and advocate for freedom of expression to characterizing him as a high-tech terrorist or a threat to national security. During the period from 2011 to 2014, Julian Assange received a mix of support and criticism from various individuals and organizations. Here are some key assessments and comments about Assange during those years. Daniel Domskitberg, a former associate of Assange, criticized Assange's character and his handling of the collateral murder video clip in his 2011 memoir. Domskitberg described Assange as having both positive qualities like being free-thinking, energetic, and brilliant, and negative traits such as being paranoid, power-obsessed, and monomaniacal. In March 2011, 
Australian author Robert Mann referred to Assange as one of the best-known and most respected human beings on Earth. In September 2011, The Guardian, New York Times, El País, Der Spiegel, and Le Monde jointly criticized Assange's decision to publish unredacted State Department cables. Some WikiLeaks insiders, including Bergetar John's daughter, also criticized Assange's handling of moral issues and alleged dictatorial tendencies within WikiLeaks. Vaughn Smith, founder of the Frontline Club, expressed support for Assange's efforts to bring important issues into public discourse, emphasizing the importance of discussing secrecy in society. Diplomatic cables from 2011 and 2012 revealed that Australian diplomats did not believe the US investigation of Assange was politically motivated. The cables also suggested that complaints about threats to Assange were part of a media campaign. In April 2012, Ecuadorian President Rafael Correa praised WikiLeaks on Assange's television show World Tomorrow, describing Assange as being in the club of the persecuted. In 2012, some individuals, such as Bob Beckel, called for Assange's assassination, while others, like filmmaker Oliver Stone, expressed support for Assange and condemned his victimization. In 2013, Gemma Mercan noted that pundits from both the left and the right had become more interested in tribalism than the truth when it came to Assange. She highlighted the importance of WikiLeaks in exposing corruption, war crimes, torture, and cover-ups, suggesting that even his disenchanted former supporters might come to his defense if he were prosecuted in the US. Andrew O'Hagan, the ghostwriter of Assange's autobiography, provided a complex characterization of Assange in early 2014, describing him as passionate, funny, lazy, courageous, vain, paranoid, moral, and manipulative. In November 2014, Spanish Podemos party leader Pablo Iglesias expressed his support for Assange, referring to him as an activist and a journalist, and criticized his persecution. These assessments highlight the diverse range of opinions about Assange during this period, reflecting a mixture of praise and criticism for his actions and character. The debate about Assange's role and impact continued to evolve during these years. During the period from 2015 to 2018, Julian Assange continued to receive a mix of support and criticism from various individuals. Here are some key assessments and comments about Assange during those years. British Member of Parliament Jeremy Corbyn, in July 2015, opposed Assange's extradition to the US, expressing concerns about the consequences of such an extradition. As the leader of the Labour Party in April 2019, he called for the British government to oppose Assange's extradition to the US, citing Assange's role in exposing evidence of atrocities in Iraq and Afghanistan. In October 2016, James Ball, who had worked with Assange in the past, suggested that Assange had personal motivations, including a desire to settle scores with Hillary Clinton and reassert himself on the world stage. Ball did not believe Assange knowingly worked as a tool of the Russian state. That same month, Nadia Tolokonikova, a member of the Russian punk rock band Pussy Riot and an advisory board member of the Courage Foundation, criticized Assange for his connections to the Russian government. Her comments reflected concerns about Assange's interactions with foreign governments. In 2017, Barrett Brown, a journalist and activist, accused Assange of acting as a covert political operative during the 2016 US election diverting WikiLeaks from its focus on exposing corporate and government wrongdoing. Brown considered exposing such wrongdoing appropriate but believed that working with an authoritarian leader to deceive the public was indefensible. Laura Poitras, a filmmaker and journalist, described Assange in May 2017 as admirable, brilliant, and flawed, reflecting the complex nature of her assessment. In late May 2017, Ecuadorian President Moreno referred to Assange as a hacker, but expressed respect for his human rights and affirmed that Assange's asylum in the embassy would continue. These assessments demonstrate the diverse range of opinions about Assange during this period, with some individuals supporting his efforts to expose information of public interest, while others raised concerns about his motivations and associations. The debate about Assange's role in politics and journalism continued to evolve during these years. 
From 2019 to the present, Julian Assange's situation has continued to be a topic of debate and discussion among journalists, commentators, and media organizations. Here are some key points made during this period. In the days before Assange's arrest in 2019, the Guardian's editorial board expressed mixed sentiments. While acknowledging the divisive nature of Assange's work, they argued that it would be wrong to extradite him. They noted that he had exposed information that should never have been hidden but also pointed out his legal troubles in the UK, including skipping bail. They suggested that he should face accountability for these actions. Following Assange's arrest in 2019, there was a debate about whether he should be considered a journalist. Some prominent news outlets, including the Associated Press, CNN, the Sydney Morning Herald, the LA Times, National Review, The Economist, and The Washington Post, argued that he was not a journalist. Others, such as The Independent, The Intercept, The Committee to Protect Journalists, and The Washington Post, by different authors, maintained that he was a journalist, and his actions were protected. In December 2019, Australian journalist Mary Costakidis expressed her fascination with Assange's work, particularly his role in creating a platform for whistleblowers to upload data anonymously. In January 2021, Australian journalist John Pilger warned that if Assange were to be extradited, it would have implications for all journalists who challenge those in power, potentially putting their safety at risk. In November 2022, major international newspapers, including The Guardian, The New York Times, Le Monde, Der Spiegel, and El País, published an open letter advocating for the end of the U.S. government's prosecution of Julian Assange for publishing secrets. However, they did not urge the government to drop the case related to the hacking-related charge. Nils Melzer, in his 2022 book, The Trial of Julian Assange, A Story of Persecution, contended that Assange's treatment by the United States, Great Britain, Sweden, and Ecuador exposed systemic failures that undermined the integrity of democratic, rule of law institutions. In 2023, former Trump administration CIA director Mike Pompo described Assange in his memoir as a useful idiot for Russia to exploit. However, Louis Menand of The New Yorker noted that despite Assange's controversial actions, many top newspaper editors maintained that his work was protected by the First Amendment, and the Committee to Protect Journalists protested the charges against him. These statements and debates reflect the ongoing discussions about Assange's role, legal proceedings, and broader implications for journalism, freedom of the press, and national security. Honors and Awards 2008, The Economist New Media Award 2009, Amnesty International UK New Media Award for Kenya, The Cry of Blood, Extrajudicial Killings and Disappearances 2010, Time Person of the Year, Reader's Choice 2010, Sam Adams Award 2010, Le Monde Reader's Choice Award for Person of the Year 2010, Rockstar of the Year by the Italian edition of Rolling Stone 2010, Honorary Member, Media, Entertainment and Arts Alliance 2011, Free Dacier Award 2011, Sydney Peace Foundation Gold Medal 2011, Walkley Award 2011, Martha Gellhorn Prize for Journalism 2011, Voltaire Award for Free Speech 2012, Big Brother Award Italy 2012, Hero of Privacy 2013, Global Exchange Human Rights Award, People's Choice 2013, Yoko Ono Lennon Courage Award for the Arts 2013, New York Festival's World's Best TV and Films Silver World Medal 2013, the Brazilian Press Association Human Rights Award 2014, Union of Journalists in Kazakhstan Top Prize 2019, U forward slash NGL Galizer Prize 2019, Gavin McFadden Award 2019, Catalan Dignity Prize 2020, Stuttgart Peace Prize 2021, Honorary Member, Penn Center Germany 
2023, Conrad Wolf Prize. Bibliography. Underground, Tales of Hacking, Madness and Obsession on the Electronic Frontier, 1997. Cypherpunks, Freedom and the Future of the Internet, or Books, 2012. When Google Met WikiLeaks, or Books, 2014. The WikiLeaks Files, The World According to the U.S. Empire, by WikiLeaks. Verso Books, 2015. Filmography, as a producer. Collateral Murder, 2010. World Tomorrow, 2012, host. Mediaston, 2013. The Engineer, 2013. As Himself. The War You Don't See, 2010. The Simpsons, 2012, cameo, episode, at long last leave. Citizen 4, 2014. The Yes Men Are Revolting, 2014. Terminal F forward slash Chasing Edward Snowden, 2015. Asylum, 2016. Risk, 2016. Architects of Denial, 2017. The New Radical, 2017. Further reading, books. You Can't Read This Book, Censorship in an Age of Freedom by Nick Cohen, 2012. In Defense of Julian Assange, edited by Tariq Ali and Margaret Kunstler, 2019. Assange, El Antisovereign, by Juan Branco, Paris, Editions du Cerf, 2020. Julian Assange in His Own Words, edited by Karen Sharp, 2021. The Trial of Julian Assange, by Nils Melzer, 2022. Films. Underground, The Julian Assange Story, 2012, Australian TV Drama. Julian, 2012, Australian Short Film. The Fifth Estate, 2013, American Thriller. We Steal Secrets, The Story of WikiLeaks, 2013, American Documentary. Hacking Justice, 2017, German Documentary. Idhaker, 2021, Australian documentary produced by Assange's brother Gabriel Shipton. This revised format provides a more organized and readable presentation of Julian Assange's honors, works, and additional sources of information. In conclusion, Julian Assange's journey has been one of immense complexity, intrigue, and controversy. From his early days as a computer programmer to the founding of WikiLeaks, Assange's commitment to transparency and the exposure of government and corporate secrets reshaped the landscape of investigative journalism. Throughout the years, his actions and decisions have ignited passionate debates about freedom of the press, national security, and individual liberties. Assange's contributions, whether viewed as courageous acts of whistleblowing or as security breaches with severe consequences, have left an indelible mark on the world. The remarkable support and condemnation he has garnered from politicians, journalists, and public figures worldwide highlight the polarizing nature of his work. As Assange's legal battles continue and the debate over his status as a journalist persists, the global community remains divided. However, what remains indisputable is that his case underscores the critical questions of the digital age, where technology and the dissemination of information are fundamentally changing the way we perceive the boundaries of freedom, privacy, and accountability. In the end, the story of Julian Assange serves as a microcosm of a rapidly evolving world where the clash between secrecy and transparency, government power and individual rights, and technological innovation and ethical responsibility rages on. The outcome of his legal proceedings may well shape the future of journalism, national security, and the delicate balance between information and its exposure. Julian Assange